Hi, everybody. I'm Scott Watson from the Alumni Board, and I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this evening. We will get started with our introduction and presentation from Dr. Fuller in just over a minute. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is Scott Watson, and for a few more weeks, I'm the Vice President of the Alumni Board. I want to thank you for joining us, and uh, we are in for a real, real treat. Hope College, as you may or may not know, offers a number of different awards, some of them under the auspices of the Alumni Association. Those include the Hope for Humanity Award, the Meritorious Service Award, and specifically the, our Alumni Association has an award called the 10 Under 10 Award. That is an award that is given to 10 student graduates who have graduated within the last 10 years. And you're encouraged to go to the website and read the criteria for that and nominate deserving students who have graduated within the last 10 years. As you might imagine, it's a long list, but that is a list that needs your input because each year we pick at least 10 students, um, or graduates that uh, get that award. And then we have some students that age off. So your nominations to that are very, very important. And so it is with the Distinguished Alumni Association Award. That is the highest award that we as an alumni association give to an alumni of Hope College. And if you are like me, Hope College and its people absolutely positively made an indelible mark on my life. It altered the trajectory of my life. And so when we look at those who we consider for the Distinguished Alumni Award, we look at those who have been exceptional in their chosen field. We look at the impact positively that they've had on their community. And then we look also at their involvement with Hope College. We aren't allowed to talk about the numbers, but I can tell you this, we give two awards a year. And so let's just say if we had 100 nominees, if you're the 20th, in that rank, um, you're nowhere near because we give two awards a year. And so when we read through those, we really are picking between great and great and great and great. So when we have an opportunity to award a distinguished alumni award, it is going to the very best of us, the very best of the Hope College graduates. And so that's what makes a night like tonight when we not only get to recognize uh, a distinguished alumni, but we get to hear from them, interact with them, ask them questions. That's what makes a night like tonight so very, very exciting. And I would say the same thing about the Distinguished Alumni Award that I said about the 10 under 10. If you know someone who is deserving of our consideration, please, please nominate them. Information is available at hope.edu slash alumni slash awards. All of the criteria for the various awards are there, as well as information on how you can nominate them. You cannot win an award if you are not nominated. And I am so passionate about our various awards and I encourage you um, to nominate those who are deserving. We read through all of those nominations and it is joy beyond measure to read through them, discuss, and then participate in the decision um, as to who gets not only our 10 under 10 awards, but as I mentioned, our distinguished alumni awards. And that's really why we are here today to recognize Dr. Deb Fuller, Deb is a graduate in 1987, which means we were there at the same time, though our orbits were um, did not overlap very much at all. While at Hope College, Dr. Fuller studied biology, Spanish, and math. Proof right there that she's a lot smarter than I am. But she also, uh, like so many of us that have been to Hope, well-rounded and had other activities. She was in mortar board. Uh, she was a swimmer. She ran cross country and she was involved in the Hope College track program. She received her PhD in cellular and molecular pathology. And she is a professor of microbiology at the University of Washington. She's also the chief of infectious, infectious disease and translational medicine at the Washington National Primate Research Institute in Washington, and she serves as the Chief Technology Officer and the co-founder of Orlance. She's married to her husband, Jim, and she has two kids. Tonight, as we get ready to spend time with her, I want to point out just a couple of things. 
there is a chat feature. And in that chat feature, you uh, will notice that the nomination uh, page has been posted for you to look at. That's a place in the chat for you to, uh, to offer comments, to send messages to Dr. Fuller, to send well wishes to Dr. Fuller. There is also a Q&A feature. Please use the Q&A feature if you have a question for Deb. Um, that is uh, where those will come in to us and then I will relay those to her and she will be able to answer those uh, at the end of our time together. So again, we are honored, privileged and excited to be able to spend some time this evening with the very best of us, those that have spent time at Hope College, those that uh, have had their trajectory altered by Hope College and the very best of us. She is one of us. And the thing that I love most about Deb is she's so smart and that you're going to get to experience what I've experienced. I host a little radio show and she's been on the show three or four times with me. And she takes the most complex scientific things and she makes them so ultimately understandable. So she not only is brilliant, she's a wonderful communicator. You're going to enjoy our time today. Interact with her through the chat feature, ask questions through the Q&A feature, and without any ado, it is my absolute privilege and honor and exciting opportunity to introduce to you one of this year's Distinguished Alumni Award winners, Dr. Deb Fuller. And thank you, Scott, for the wonderful uh, introduction. And thank you, the board, for this amazing honor. Um, of all, all of the honors that I've had and, and awards, this one means uh, probably the most to me, um, you know, to be honored in such a way by your, by your alma mater. Um, and so I, I'm here today. I'm going to give you a talk I've never given before. This is one that, uh, you know, generally as a scientist, I'm going to be talking about science and data. Well, I'm not going to present you, inundate you with dust, a lot of data. But what I want to do is kind of tell you about the journey, uh, starting at Hope College and uh, where I am today, and, and actually get to where we're going uh, in the future as well. And so to start with, I'm actually going to start with the future the future of vaccination. And so I want you to take a minute with me and just imagine a future in which there is a pandemic outbreak, but it's able to be stopped almost immediately by the fact that people can go in with a little box and they're able to actually put into that box a sequence of the pathogen. And within only three days, they can produce 500,000 vaccines that they're gonna be able to vaccinate people and be able to stop that outbreak before it actually occurs. And then imagine if you all looking at this picture here, that instead of getting jabs in your arms, what you're going to end up ha having is that somebody is going to point a little uh, device at you and it's going to be like a phaser like the Star Trek guy, and he's going to point it at you and uh, you're going to get zapped, you're vaccinated, zapped, you're vaccinated, zapped, you're vaccinated. So, uh, so now you probably all think I'm crazy. And I think that's great because I want you thinking about me as being, uh, you know, that's the mindset that you need, need to be in because Throughout my career, um, when you come up with certain ideas, they tend to be a little bit crazy. And uh, in, you know, I had one mentor tell me that, you know, if you, if you have a good, if people are telling you your ideas are crazy, you're probably onto something. So let's get started with the present. I'm, I do have a couple of disclosures I have to make. Uh, as Scott mentioned, I am a co-founder of Orlands and I'm also a scientific advisor for another biotech company called HDT. Uh, in which uh, both of these companies I'm working with to develop vaccines. Um, so let's start with the here and now. We are here uh, in, a, in a pandemic. Uh, and as of yesterday, you can see that we've had 3 million global deaths, over 137 million cases, and we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Now, up until vaccines came about, our way of controlling those, this pandemic is through wearing masks and social distancing. But now that we have va vaccines, these are really our best hope to be able to stop this pandemic by hopefully building herd immunity in the population. And so vaccines really are the most effective tools to stop the pandemic. And I wanna just kind of walk through with you before I get into talking about what my lab is doing and what my career has involved is really get, just give you a bit of a primer on how vaccines actually work. Well, first of all, I always think of vaccines as an ounce of prevention, a pound of cure. And what that means is just a little bit of vaccination can actually provide a substantial impact in the world in terms of saving lives. It's estimated that vaccines have saved more lives worldwide than all other medical interventions combined. Let's take, for example, the measles vaccine. 
Like in the 1960s, the measles was running rampant. You can see the number of cases. With the introduction of a vaccine, you can see the immediate drop of this infectious disease to the point where we get herd immunity, 70, 90% of the population was immune, and we rarely see measles unless there's a reduction in vaccination rates. So what is herd immunity? I get this, you've probably heard a lot about herd immunity. Uh, what happens in an infection is that you've got it running rampant uh, in the population. You see all these red guys here and there's no uh, immunity. And so everybody's susceptible to the infection. As people start to get infected, some people actually build up some degree of immunity or with vaccination, but there's still a lot of people who are unimmune. And so they are still vulnerable to uh, the infection. With COVID-19, this is where we're at right now. Where we're trying to get to here is to get the majority of the population immune uh, against this particular virus, which means that it doesn't mean 100% of people have to get vaccinated. But if you get enough people vaccinated, that means that the people who are not immune are going to be protected by virtue of the fact that they're surrounded by other people who are immune. And eventually the virus just runs out of places to go and it disappears. That's what we saw with measles. And so let's just kind of quick, before we get into the kinds of vaccines we're talking about today, just tell, tell you a little bit about where we were before COVID, okay? Because there's always the pre-COVID era and the post-COVID era. And so I'm gonna tell you what kind of vaccines we had before, these sort of traditional types of vaccines. Uh, one type of vaccine we have is a, called a live attenuated vaccine. That's where you basically weaken the virus and you inject that into the body and you make an immune response against it. Another type, is uh, a dead virus. And this is uh, called an inactivated uh, uh, vaccine. And that's just basically where you kill the, the virus and you inject it in the body and that induces an immune response. I call this back type of vaccine, the shake and bake vaccine. And then we have another type that many of us are familiar with. And that's just where we take a small part of the virus. In this case, it'd be the spike protein from, from coronavirus. And we actually uh, produce that in a lab. And then we inject that protein into your body and you make immune responses against that you know, part of the, of, of, the, of the virus. In this particular part of the virus, which is a spike protein, that virus uses that spike protein to be able to get into our cells. So if we can make immune responses against it, we can block that virus from getting into our body. So, um, so this one is not being made for SARS-CoV-2 because it's not really that safe. It could undergo reversion. Uh, now in China, they did make a particular vaccine that's inactivated, but it's not as effective. And this particular one takes is pretty effective, but it takes a long time to develop. We are gonna get some in at, uh, uh, what we call recombinant protein vaccines coming our way. One's called Novavax, uh, but they're not really uh, ready yet. So uh, live attenuate vaccine, our measles vaccine is a good example. Inactivated, our flu vaccine is a good example. And uh, 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 recombinant protein vaccine, that's be the, like our hepatitis B vaccine. So here's these new kids on the block that you've been hearing about the mRNA and the viral vector vaccine. So uh, a lot of you have been getting Moderna and Pfizer and BioNTech. Uh, J&J got uh, put out, it's, it's been uh, delayed a little bit, but I, you know, I'm pretty confident it's gonna get rolled back out again. Um, so the mRNA vaccines is basically take a, a code that is encoding that spike protein from SARS-CoV-2 or whatever part of the virus that you wanna target. And then you encapsulate that into a lipid uh, coating, a lipid nanoparticle is what we call it. You inject that into the body and that lipid nanoparticle is gonna fuse with your cells and dump that RNA inside your cell. And then your cell is gonna be able to read that code. And once it does, it starts to manufacture your own vaccine. It's basically your body's making your own vaccine. And once you actually start producing that protein, then you start making antibodies against that. And those antibodies are what's gonna protect you from the real deal if you were exposed to it. Now, a viral vector vaccine works almost the same way in a sense. It's the same idea was trying to get a genetic code into your cell and instruct your code to make the vaccine. But instead of using uh, RNA encapsulated in the lipid nanoparticle, it uses a, 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 a virus that really doesn't cause any disease in us. It's a, called an adenovirus. It actually is only uh, gets the uh, nucleic acid or the genetic material into our cells and it doesn't replicate. It just gets it into our cells and then goes away. And so they kind of both trying to achieve the same thing, getting your cell to read a genetic code, but one uh, uses a virus to do that and the other uses a lipid nanoparticle to do it. And so both mRNA vaccines and viral vector vaccines are really effective, okay? And you may have heard that we got some variants coming out and some of these vaccines, their, uh, their effectiveness against some of these variants may be less. 
But one of the things that they actually do, both types of vaccines induces is antibody responses. And we talked about those already. Those antibody are able to block uh, a, a uh, virus from being able to infect your cells by binding up on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the virus. But these types of vaccines also induce this other type of response is called a T cell, okay? And what the T cell can do is actually in the event that a virus, let's say there's a new variant and it gets past your antibody defenses and gets inside your cell where this T cell can find and eliminate that virus. And we think that's probably why both the mRNA and the viral vector vaccines have shown enormous, nearly 100% efficacy in protecting us from severe disease and death because they're able to eliminate the virus from the body even if it gets past your antibody response. And so I want to emphasize that there's really three ways that COVID-19 vaccines protect. Some people are kind of hearing, hey, there's breakthrough infections. I got the vaccine, but I'm still pos got positive for COVID-19. That's actually expected, okay? There are three ways that the vaccines are gonna protect. They're either gonna protect you from infection, which means that you won't get infected at all. The antibodies completely block the virus from infecting your cells, okay? Or though that virus might get inside your body, but your immune defenses are able to, to shut it down or eliminate it before it causes disease. Or it might get in your body, you might feel a little bit of sick, but you're not gonna get so sick that you're gonna end up in the hospital. And importantly, all different levels of protection is gonna reduce the amount of virus that you're shedding. That's gonna to help to reduce the transmission in the population. And so vaccines are designed to really do all levels of this kind of protection. It really depends on you. We're a very different uh, heterogeneous population. We all respond a little bit differently to vaccines. So there's a spectrum of protection, but for sure, if you get a COVID-19 vaccine, you're gonna be better off than you had if you hadn't gotten a vaccine. So one of the big questions I always get asked is how is it possible to develop an mRNA vaccine so fast, okay? They were actually developed in record time. So let's have a look at what the traditional vaccine timeline would used to be five to 10 years. I mean, the fastest vaccine before COVID-19 was four years uh, that it took to, uh, to develop. And this is a typical timeline. You start with discovering development, you, you know, discover this pathogen. Now you got to figure out how you, which uh, part of the pathogen are you going to make immune responses again, against and so on. And then you got to formulate a vaccine and then you got to do preclinical studies. And then you do three sets of human trials and that can take two to three years. And then you go into a process of manufacturing it, which can take quite a bit of time. Well, how do we get those mRNA vaccines out so quickly? Well, first of all, the discovery was shortened considerably. Now, generally with traditional vaccines, you have to get the pathogen, you got to isolate different sorts of things, you got to grow it up in the lab. That takes a long time just to even figure that out. With RNA vaccines and the viral vector vaccines, you only need the genetic code from the pathogen. And once you have that, you can start making the vaccine immediately. So it's like weeks instead of years to actually make a candidate mRNA vaccine. And then they do those preclinical studies. They finish those pretty quickly. What they did with human trials, instead of having them go, uh, there's three clinical trials. You go phase one for safety, phase two, a little bit larger group, and phase three, you go into efficacy. Well, what they did is they overlapped those phases because they knew that we had to get a vaccine out as soon as possible. This virus was spreading. So they overlapped it, uh, these particular uh, uh, phases. Uh, all of these phases are testing safety. And it's important to know that in, they no safety steps were skipped at all in this entire process. The overlapping is not traditionally done because if say your vaccine fails in phase two, for example, and you went and overlapped it and started phase three before phase two was done, then the whole vaccine will be done. You've wasted a lot of money starting phase three. Well, money wasn't the issue here. It's saving lives was the big issue here. So they overlapped and they took the risk in terms of the finance. They also took the risk in the finances and starting the manufacturing before they even knew whether or not they'd actually get the vaccine approved and licensed for use. If they hadn't, then all of this, the stuff they were stockpiling would have been thrown away. So that's why we were able to get there much, much quicker uh, than a traditional. The other reason is because these mRNA vaccines might seem new to you, but they've been around for quite some time. And there were companies like Moderna and Pfizer that were already developing a whole battery of different types of vaccines based on this exact platform. mRNA vaccines are something we call plug and play. So you can take, say they were developing a CMV vaccine and a Zika vaccine for several years already. And they had them in phase one and two human clinical trials. And all they had to do is take that backbone and pop out the gene for Zika, for example, and pop in the gene for SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And so that was made, helped to make it really quicker because they really had all of this infrastructure in place already. 
And so what's happening in our lab? Of course, we were developing a, a vaccine as well. This is a, a real talented postdoc uh, in my lab who uh, he's in the biosafety level three. That's the containment that we have to actually work with SARS-CoV-2. And then what you're looking at here is a plaque uh, assay for detecting the amount of virus in the dish there. Um, and so what we really wanted to focus on and when we got started is we knew these big farmers were gonna get out these first generation vaccines very quickly. And we began to think about really what does an effective pandemic vaccine, an ideal pandemic vaccine, what should it do? Um, we wanna be able to induce immunity safely. That's the first priority, but also quickly. Ideally with just one dose, two would be okay, but one dose would be better because if you only have to have one dose, you're gonna build immunity in the population a lot quicker. And a lot of people don't come back for their second dose. So it's harder to get people to do that. So there's only one vaccine that's able to do that right now. So um, we also wanna have a long-term antibody T cell responses. We don't wanna to have to have you coming back for booster shots every three months, okay? We wanna at least last for a year, if not longer. Uh, and right now we don't know how long the immunity is gonna last in our current vaccines. Right now they've only been studying for six months because that's how long we've had them in people. We wanna make sure they're equally effective across different demographics. Traditionally, vaccines don't work as well in the elderly or the immune compromised. And so we wanna make sure that uh, a pandemic vaccine is gonna work, especially in people most vulnerable to this virus like the elderly. And finally, the big thing is fast scale up, stable at room temperature and self-administered. Not a single one of the vaccine candidates that we have out there are able to do this. This is this is a has proved to be to some extent a barrier in terms of the rollout that you're seeing. The rollout didn't happen quite as quickly. For example, the Pfizer has to have that deep uh, freezer uh, to be able to uh, distribute and store. Uh, it comes out and it stays at room temperature too long. It's no good anymore. So uh, so this is really important, I think, for an effective pandemic vaccine. And so what we're doing is we're focusing on developing a second generation vaccine that's going to hopefully address these shortcomings. And this is really to give you an example. When we're seeing vaccines being distributed all over here in the United States, where in some states it's getting close to 40% of the people vaccinated. But look, really it's only about 5% of the global population has been vaccinated so far. There's areas of the country that are not getting vaccines. And part of it has to do with the limits and the ability to distribute these vaccines. They all are dependent on a cold chain and it's harder to get vaccines out here. Okay, but the reality is as long as there's virus replicating somewhere, okay, in, in wherever uh, there's people vulnerable to this virus, it's going to be able to undergo mutations. And we're gonna be able to have new variants. And if those variants uh, make our vaccines less effective, they can come back and bite us right back in the butt again and reinfect people vaccinated already. So it's really important that we not just vaccinate and be nas nationalistic about our vaccinations, but we actually vaccinate the globe and, and make an every effort to make sure everybody has an opportunity to get immunity. And so one way that we're gonna to try to do that is this next generation RNA vaccine that we're developing in our lab. What we're actually developing is something that's called a self-amplifying replicant RNA vaccine. So it's, it's an RNA vaccine, just like you've heard about. But it's a little bit different in the sense that once we uh, actually make the RNA and the RNA gets inside your cell, our RNA actually includes an additional code, it's called a replicase, and it tells that RNA to make copies of itself, okay? So we got one RNA strand in, it now multiplies itself multiple times. That means that that one vaccine is gonna make a lot more vaccine antigen and more vaccine antigen would make it more immunogenic. And so we're thinking this might work in a single shot, this might be more effective in immune compromise in elderly, and it might be able to induce more durable immunity. And so uh, just as a comparison, here's uh, the particular vaccine that we're working on. We also work with this, uh, uh, this uh, particular formulation in collaboration with this biotech company called HDT Bio in Seattle. And what they did is that uh, they made a different lipo nanoparticle form formulation. Remember those lipo nanoparticles are what's used to actually get your RNA into the cell, but they're also very important to stabilize the RNA. Because RNA, when it's just kind of left out hanging out there, it's just gonna be degrade, it's very unstable. And so these particular little nanoparticles particles are there to be able to uh, protect the RNA uh, from that degradation. So the problem is with these little nanoparticles is that you have to freeze them to like minus 80 Celsius for Pfizer's vaccine, minus 20, and they're not stable at room temperature at all. Within hours, this will fall, fall apart and then the vaccine would not be effective. And so that has limited its distribution worldwide. And so what HDT did was come try to come up with a solution for that. And instead, they made a different sort of lipo nanoparticle. Now, the particular lipo nanoparticles that Moderna and Pfizer use, you have to encapsulate the RNA into the particle. 
And that's actually a fairly complex process. It takes a lot slower to scale up. It also uses components like cholesterol that are somewhat limited in supply in the world. And so we could run out. And as I mentioned, shorter shelf life. So what they did, they made a particle that instead of the RNA going on the inside, it actually just sits on the surface uh, of this particle. So what that allows them to do is actually scale up the nanoparticle separate from your RNA vaccine and then mix it right before we actually use it. Now, these two separate components are much more stable at room temperature. They can sit out uh, even after formulating them together for up to three weeks at room temperature. So that's a real big advantage there. Um, and so just to kind of get to the, the point here on, at the end of our, our study is what we did is we investigated this particular uh, vaccine. It's called Lion Replicating RNA Vaccine. And we uh, did a preclinical study and we got really uh, promising results in our preclinical study. We saw uh, in animals, we saw sustained protective antibody after only one shot for an eight months, which is as long as we followed uh, the, uh, the analysis. We got those T cell responses that are gonna be able to uh, clear the infection if you get infected. And we even saw strong responses in aged animals indicating the vaccine should work in the elderly pretty well. Now, I just want to give a, a shout out here to Jesse, who was my postdoc. He was really the person who, who led the RNA uh, vaccine design in my lab, and also Megan O'Connor, another postdoc in my lab, who led the studies in the, uh, the animal studies. These two, without these two superstars, I would have never been able uh, to get to this point as quickly as we did. And so where are we with this particular vaccine? So as I mentioned, this vaccine is designed not only to be more stable at room temperature, but we updated it so that it's actually now encoding uh, sequences that will be able to protect against the emerging variants that we're hearing about that are coming out of, for example, South Africa and Brazil. Uh, and so this has been designed to protect against the new variants. And you can see how quickly this started. Uh, Jesse called me in December of 2020 and he said, uh, 2019, he said, hey, you know, uh, you know, there's this virus coming, coming around. Should we do something about it? So we got started right away in January. And within a week, we already had some vaccines that we were testing in animals. And you can see uh, that we just started in March of 2021, uh, phase one human trials of this vaccine in India and in Africa and in Brazil. So this is really fast. Uh, and that's really thanks to the, the, the particular RNA technology. And so I kind of want to emphasize a little bit, you know, because a lot of people say, well, why are you still developing our, uh, a vaccine for COVID? I mean, isn't the problem solved? I don't think so. I think we're going to need five to seven effective vaccines that all work together because no vaccine is perfect. They all kind of have some advantages over another. I, I like to liken a lot of times to, to my son, Brendan here, who was, uh, played archery, okay? And he actually did extremely well, scored the high score that day, not by getting one arrow exactly in the center, but getting very many arrows close to the center. And in many ways, I kind of see vaccines in the same way, uh, getting close to that center and together working almost like a team and stopping this pandemic. And so mRNA vaccines, really, when you think about it, they are truly a revolution in modern medicine. Um, it, it, I, this just, I, I can't even emphasize where we're gonna go with this. It's, they can be used to uh, fight cancer for protection against other infectious diseases, to cure HIV. There's all kinds of things. Think about all the diseases in which our immune system is involved, allergies, autoimmunity, infectious diseases, cancer. mRNA vaccines are unique in their ability to be able to put them in our bodies and they can actually uh, train our bodies to better respond and, and uh, protect ourselves against these particular diseases. So these are not going away. Yeah, I always think as a vaccinologist, always as this era, it's gonna be like a pre-COVID and a post-COVID era because mRNA vaccines were well on their way to this level of development, but they were just kind of inching along. COVID-19 put them over the top. And I always say that, you know, developing a vaccine was a, was a turning point for COVID, but COVID is also a turning point for vaccines. It's, it's a revolution in a sense like, uh, you know, like it, almost like this, this meteor, right? <laughs> like uh, the pre-meteor and the post-meteor. I mean, that's how big it really, uh, really is in terms of how it's going to change modern medicine for us in the future. And I, I'm actually proud to say that I was at, you know, part of the team, of people over 30 years ago that helped to start and this frontier, this new area uh, of modern medicine. I'm gonna give you a little bit of insight and we're not quite here yet. I'm gonna tell you about this futuristic thing in a minute, but we're gonna take now a step back in the past and I'm gonna tell you how it's got started. And it all got started right here 
and Hope College. And you, I don't know if you all recognize this building anymore, but I hear it's not there anymore. It's Peel Science Center. That's where uh, I was working uh, in the lab under the mentorship of Dr. James Jen Dan Teal uh, in the biology department at Hope College here. And uh, I started working with him on, on uh, uh, studies to investigate how plant cells could metabolize uh, uh, chemicals into mutagens. Uh, and so it was really exciting research. It was just exciting just for me to learn how to be in the lab and how to think about doing research in science. And it was what inspired me to think about that I wanted to be a scientist uh, for my career. And so right after I went into Hope College, I actually entered in a PhD program at the University of Wisconsin in molecular environmental toxicology. It was really uh, closely aligned with what I actually worked on as an undergraduate. Um, but what happened was uh, in my last couple years there at Hope College, we had a little bit of financial issues uh, as a family, and I actually had to work um, full time uh, in midnight to eight shift. And so as I started um, graduate school, uh, frankly, I was just pooped out. <laughs> And so I actually was there for only about a year and I decided to take a year leap of absence and maybe come back to it. And I just needed uh, that break. And so at this juncture in my life, I, I kind of, I quit school, something I had never quit anything in my life. And I quit school. I had no PhD. I had no prospects. I had no job. Uh, and so, uh, so it was sort of an interesting point in time in my life. And so I had to get a job and there was this uh, company down the road, it was called Agrocetus, it was in Middleton, Wisconsin, that were developing transgenic crops. And so while I didn't have a degree and I didn't have a job, I did have knowledge. And I had these skills that I had gotten in Hope College in the basement of Peel Science Center in how to actually culture cells, uh, plant cells. And so that helped me get a job here at this Agrocetus and these beautiful greenhouses here. And I thought I was gonna do all kinds of great, exciting science, but they just put me in the greenhouse planting seeds. And I stayed there planting quite a lot of seeds at that time. Um, but this actually, in some respects, was a seeds to my next phase in my career. Uh, what happened at Agrocetus is, is that they were working on trying to develop transgenic crops. And back then, in, in, when they were developing transgenic crops, they would, you'd have to take off the cell wall from the plant cell and make sort of a protoplast. And then you'd have to put that with this uh, bug called agrobacterium and that agrobacterium would inject the genetic material into the cell. It was a long process and it wasn't very successful because you had to rebuild the cell wall and then try to get the cell to actually multiply and become a plant again. It was very, very inefficient. And so this guy here, his name is John Sanford. He was at Cornell University and he just kind of got sick of that whole process. And he said, I just wish I could just get a gun and just shoot these plant cells, you know, and get the genes in there. And then he got to thinking, oh, I could do a gun. And so he actually did this. He actually invented a gun to actually try to inject uh, genetic material into plants. And so uh, his idea was very simple. It's like he's going to use like a gun, a gun barrel, and then he's going to actually uh, put these, uh, coat the DNA uh, that he wants to inject into the plant cells on these tiny little gold particles. And he puts them at the tip of the bullet and the bullet hits this little uh, screen here. And when the bullet hits that, it stops, but all the little gold particles keep going and they go into the plant cell. So that was his whole concept and that was the nature of his patent. Well, it turns out it really didn't work. All he ended up doing was blasting the crap out of those plant cells and they all died. And so it was a great idea, but it actually didn't work. Well, what happened was there was this other guy here at uh, Agrocetus where we were working. His name is uh, uh, Dennis McCabe and his colleague, uh, Brian Martinell. And they kind of got a wind of what John Sanford was working on. And they thought, well, you know, I. I think I could do better. I think I could actually, the, the concept makes sense to them, but they said, you know, the problem is you're killing all your cells. So they figured out a way uh, and came up with a new gene gun prototype to be able to deliver those particles in the plant cells, but without killing them, okay? Now you're looking here, if you notice this is Smithsonian, the National Museum of American History. Yep, the very first gene gun is in the Smithsonian Museum. So if you ever wanna see it, there it is. It looks like a piece of junk, doesn't it? So, but it worked. It actually was able to uh, transfect 
uh, plant cells. So if you don't have to take that cell wall off and you get the gene in there, then you can actually uh, get that uh, plant, to, uh, genetically engineered plants to, to grow much more quickly. So they reduce the amount of time. It used to take seven years just to make one plant to just one year by this, uh, this gene gun here. Uh, and if you're curious what this says here on this particular box here, it says this equipment delivers voltages of 15,000 volts at high amperage. Contact with these uh, wattage would instantly be lethal. Okay, so, so that's the equipment we were working with at Agrocetus, and it wasn't exactly OSHA compliant, but like I said, it worked. And so um, they call it the shot heard around the world because what happened was that Agrocetus gene gun, gene gun was the first one that transformed, it really transformed GMO technology. It actually generated the first Roundup Ready soybeans uh, and it rocked the food economies. Pictured here is Jim Fuller. Jim Fuller is my husband, and that's where I met him, was actually at Agrocetus. And he's credited actually with actually coming up with the very first Roundup resistant plant Iggy, who, that he named Iggy. Unfortunately, Iggy was sterile, meaning that Iggy didn't have any uh, genetic material in its, in its seed line. And so it, it kind of died. The, 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 uh, it was a chimera, basically. It had some, some of its cells were transformed and some of them were not, and none of them in their seeds. So it died, uh, but it actually, his, his work in, in developing Iggy showed that it was possible. And eventually Monsanto acquired this technology. And to this day, they are still using the gene gun to make transgenic crops. And so that just kind of led up to where we're here now and where we're going next is taking this from plants to mammals because we got to thinking if you can put, use a gene gun to deliver uh, genes into the cells of plants, why couldn't you do that in animals? Why couldn't you do that in people? And so the study that was done in, uh, published in PNS in 1990 is where they actually did that, where they took the gene gun and actually used that to deliver uh, genes into the skin of mice. And what you're seeing these little uh, spots here, that's just individual cells expressing a gene called beta gal. It turns blue uh, when it's expressed. And you can see it's really, really a lot of gene expression in the skin there. And so uh, Dennis, uh, who invented the gene gun, he you know, realized that we couldn't work with that sort of OSHA non-compliant uh, you know, apparatus that he has. So he kind of made a, a nice nifty one uh, that you see me here posed with. And basically the way that worked is you'd put your, uh, your animal basically on the top of this chamber, then you'd only have to push a button and you'd be able to, to deliver genes into that animal. So, uh, so we initially thought about gene therapy as, as you know, that this would be great for gene therapy, but we kept getting this pesky problem of actually getting an immune response. And so once you get an immune response, it suddenly dawned on us that that's, that's a vaccine, okay, that we're actually delivering genetic material into cells of an animal. And that cell, those cells are, are, are instructing, that the genetic material is instructing cells to make your own vaccine. I mean, the idea was crazy. Nobody believed that could be possible. That doesn't make any sense. There's no way you're gonna get enough cells making enough protein to make an immune response. And yet it did work. And so this was really the birth of nucleic acid, both DNA as well as RNA vaccines. I'll tell you a little bit more about DNA. Started in 1991, okay? And so here's a gene gun. It's putting little mini particles into the epidermis. But you can also inject DNA with a needle. And you can see after it gets uh, delivered, you get those nice little blue spots. You can see the expression of that antigen. This is what it looks like in the skin. So how does it trigger an immune response? Well, what happens is after those particles goes in the epidermis of the skin, there are these um, other sorts of cells in your skin. They're called epidermal Langerhans cells. And these types of cells are what we call antigen presenting cells. Their job is to pick up foreign material and present that to your immune system. So you put, if you put a, a, a gold particle and that gold particle goes inside your cell and the DNA comes off and then it starts expressing this foreign antigen, that antigen presenting cell is gonna be able to present that to the immune system and stimulate immunity. And so that's exactly what happens. Those antigen presenting cells, they're in the skin. You can see they're associated with the gold particles here. They travel then to our draining lymph node and then they associate with B and T cells and they induce antibody and T cell responses. And so that's the nuts and bolts of a DNA and RNA vaccine. So that was in 1991. So in 1992, um, I go to a Cold Spring Harbor conference. I had some interesting data showing that this is actually working. We're getting immune responses. Um, and I get there and I, I've discovered six other groups there 
had thought of the same thing. And they were reporting immune responses in mice after injecting DNA or RNA with just like a needle and syringe, okay? And I'm like, no way, this is great. Because everybody was telling us we were crazy and I find six other people were just as crazy as we are. But I mean, it wasn't like it gained popular acceptance though. And this conference report, as you can see, is just that we were just a group of crazies rather than just one crazy person. Uh, and so like this conference report was kind of nice about it. They said, well, the drawback of this was not considered. Um, you know, you're going to introduce the DNA and it's going to degrade and there's only a small number of cells that are going to be able to express it. There's no way this is going to work is basically what they're saying. Um, yeah, other people were more blind. Yeah, they said, yeah, you don't think this will ever be useful, do you? Um, but we did. We believed it was going to be useful. So we went away and all of a sudden, because there was multiple ones of us, it became sort of a race to try to get this into a clinical trial from animals and then into people. So we had to talk to Dennis about this because all we had was this particular type of gene gun uh, apparatus here. This is one that um, you know was used for both plants as well as animals. It's 300 pounds. Um, but how are we going to get people to use that? I mean, you'd have to look at this thing. You'd have to get them to hoist up there and sit on this thing. That's, that's just not going to work. So uh, Dennis went back to the drawing board and he came up with this handheld gene gun. Okay, this is going to make my, looks exactly like a gun. And I've got a little prop here for it. I'm going to just actually show you right here. This is it. This is the gene gun. And I, I, know, I know you're all thinking here that this just looks like something we made, like a piece of junk that we made in our garage. And, uh, you know, it's true. It was actually kind of made in the garage, but it works. Okay, it actually works. Uh, let me show you very quickly how, how this actually works uh, in, the, in there. So what happens is that we actually put the uh, uh, DNA on these gold particles. Okay, these particles are, are gold. They're about one micron in size and a one micron particle is gonna fit into your cell very nicely. What's really cool is that these particles, when they're formulated, they are completely stable room temperature, okay? So that would uh, support worldwide distribution of this type of vaccine. So then we actually put them in these cartridges and these cartridges get loaded up in the cylinder of this gene gun. And when we press this trigger, it actually pulls in some helium and that helium accelerates those gold particles and delivers at supersonic speed and then delivers them into our skin, okay? So this is a needle-free delivery, okay? Which means it has potential for self-administrator administration. You don't need like a trained clinician to inject you with a needle. You could just pop yourself with that, so. And then finally, when it penetrates into your skin, it's completely pain-free, okay? And so, I mean, a lot of people are like really into the sunlight, they really hate the needles. And so uh, we think it'd be a really good way to actually not only uh, improve, uh, you know, getting more people to take the vaccines, but, uh, but uh, worldwide distribution of this particular type of vaccine strategy. So that's it, that's that bar there. Remember none of the vaccines for COVID-19 are meeting this, but this particular type of vaccine strategy could actually do that. So we ended up finding, doing a lot of studies, a handheld gene gun uh, to prove to be superior to a lot of other DNA vaccine technologies that were coming out. I mentioned before that there were other groups just injecting DNA in the muscle and that was actually working. Um, but there was another group that actually came up with a different way because it wasn't that efficient. The gene gun was a lot more efficient. Um, and so they came up with another way where they actually inject it in and try to open the pores of the cell and help more DNA get in. They actually do an electrical charge and then that opens up the cell as well. Uh, that actually did improve uh, delivery into the muscle a lot better, but it hurts like the dickens. I can tell you that. Imagine a needle and then you get an electrical discharge on top of that. Anyway, the gene gun ended up inducing stronger immune responses in preclinical studies with 1000 fold less DNA than either this method or this method. And the reason we think that's the case is because first look at it, you're getting direct intracellular delivery of that gold particle into each cell, plus you're going into the skin. And the skin is a very immunocompetent organ. And you think about it, we're exposed to pathogens every day. Our skin is an important barrier in protecting us from that. And within our skin cells, we have all these antigen presenting cells. It's an immune compartment. Uh, that has been developed to protect us from outside pathogens. So if we're going to put antigen in there, that's, that skin is ready to go to launch an immune, system, an immune response. And so the gene gun really took off. Okay, this is our timeline here. We just kind of went through all this stuff here. Uh, you know, by 1998, uh, we had a lot of data already in preclinical studies showing that this was really looking like it was going to work. The World Health Organization officially declared genetic immunization, both DNA and RNA, as an entirely new category of vaccines. So it was a very exciting time. Okay, I have to pack up with a little bit of sidebar because up to that particular point, 
I didn't have a PhD, okay, but I had was running a pretty robust research program. I was becoming internationally known. I was having my had my own lab, etc. And uh, you know, somebody said we want to get that PhD, maybe you know. So I uh, worked out a deal with the company I was working with that I was actually able to go back to the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, this guy, uh, Dr. David Watkins, was my mentor. Agreed to take me on, um, and uh, and get my PhD. And a lot of people ask me, well, why would you want to do that? You know, basically, I did everything backwards because most people they'll get their PhD and then they'll get their career. I had started my career and then I got my PhD. And they said, well, why do you need a PhD? You already got the career that everybody's trying to trying to get. Um, why would you go back and get it? And it really, at the time, I just thought about it is that, you know, I just want to learn something more. And this guy, he knew all kinds of things about viral immunology. I was just dying to learn. So, you know, that was really was my impetus. I just wanted to learn more. But I learned two things after I did get my PhD. So from the first thing was um, that it didn't make a difference. Okay. Um, before I had my PhD, you know, have a bachelor's degree and you're trying to actually kind of make your way in, 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 in the world within your field. And um, people kind of, you have to go six feet over the bar, right? After my PhD, they just kind of give you the benefit of the doubt and you know, everybody could use that. So it just kind of made things a lot easier for me. And the second thing was just something that a postdoc told me when I was in the lab that I've learned is really, really true. Uh, he told me, you know, a PhD doesn't make you smarter. It's just going to make you look dumber when you do stupid things. And that's something I've learned almost every single day of my life. Um, but getting back to our, our, our DNA vaccines, what um, we're back now, now I've got my PhD here and I'm back at the company working. And uh, what we ended up doing was um, trying this race to get in the clinical trials, but DNA vaccines injected with a needle entered the clinical trials first. And unfortunately, the skeptics were right. These DNA vaccines didn't work at all in people. There were few responders, there were low immune responses. It was devastating for the entire field, okay? Now we came along and our gene gun delivered DNA vaccine was successful. We were later, why? Because we had a device we also had to develop alongside of the product and they just had the product. So they got in there first. And so we had a hundred percent responder rate with antibodies and T cells. We had protective levels of immunity. Uh, I mean, we were using, again, that 1,000 fold less DNA. It was really exciting, but nobody cared. And this is the thing I learned in my field. It's like once a dogma set and everybody has kind of seen all those first clinical trials failed, it gets in their brain that this stuff's never going to work. So it doesn't matter that we publish paper after paper saying it works, it works. Nobody was paying attention. Okay. And to, up until COVID-19, there was still this underlying thought in our field that yeah, some doubts as to whether it actually would ever really work in people. Well, while my field didn't recognize it, there was a company who actually took notice and it was Pfizer decided uh, back in uh, late 1998 and they wanted to enter the vaccines market. I know everybody's gonna have Pfizer vaccine, but Pfizer was not always in the vaccines business. And when you're a big pharma, how do you get in the vaccines business or any business that you don't have a business for? You go and acquire other companies that have that already. Instant pipeline, just like that. And so they decided they had a, they actually noticed our data. They saw that our gene gun was in working very well in people and they decided they wanted to get into genetic vaccines. So they acquired our gene gun. Okay. And so we had all these clinical trials here in 2007. They actually took our gene gun, lock, stock and barrel, drove away with it. Okay. They left me with a gene gun. Okay. And said, well, if you want to still play with it, that's good. Okay. So now another sidebar. So starts my academic career because what I'm going to do with a gene gun, I've got to go somewhere with that. So I ended up taking with Gene Gun and Toe, went from Wisconsin, I went to the University of Pittsburgh, Albany Medical College, and today, uh, 2004, uh, in 2010, I came here to uh, Seattle and the University of Washington. And so here we are today. So let's uh, look at what we're doing. So our particular uh, research program here at the University of Washington is still focused on nucleic acid vaccines. And I still got this Gene Gun, okay? Remember, I still, it's right here. We use this every day. Different ones every day. Okay. And we're doing all kinds of cool stuff as well as actually bringing on other platform technologies like the Lion to deliver DNA or replicating RNA. Um, and so we've got a program looking at immunotherapy of chronic diseases for HIV and HPV and cancer. 
But a big part of our program is these rapid response vaccines to emerging infectious diseases and pandemics. So influenza and Zika and SARS-CoV-2. So we've been working on that, but we still need a clinical gene gun if we want to advance our vaccines to the clinic, right? Uh, so we can work all day and night in the lab and come cure all kinds of mice of things. But eventually, if we want it to go anywhere, we've got to do a clinical trial. And so we moved back to Pfizer and said, okay, so what happened to that gene gun that you guys took? Well, what they decided to do was to make a disposable gene gun uh, that could be single use and self-administered. Great idea, right? And so this is what it looks like, actually. And, and I have a, another prop for you. That's exactly what it looked like. That was their particular gene gun that they made. Unfortunately, in the re-engineering process, when they did that, they actually messed it up, okay? Um, it ended up not working at all. It, it sort of compromised the particle acceleration. The gold particles just bounced off the top of the skin, okay? And so you know, they got some immune response in a phase one clinical trial, but it just failed to meet their endpoint. And so they shelved the gene gun and they enter a partnership with guess who? BioNTech. And so that's the story of how Pfizer got into genetic vaccines. Well, in the meantime, I'm sitting here with all of my particular products in my lab and I say, hey, what are you gonna do with that gene gun? And they decide and they say, you know what? You can have it. So they gave the IP and the gene guns back to my lab here at the University of Washington. And that's when we co-founded Orlands, okay? And it's a company to develop a next generation of what I call supersonic clinical gene guns, okay? Or the Mach 1 gene gun. Remember this guy again? Okay, so I remember I told you we're gonna to get to a point where we're gonna be able to immunize you without a needle, we're just gonna be able to point a phaser at you and put particles in, two particles that will immunize you. Well, we're getting close. We're getting very close to that. But this is our next clinical uh, gene gun that we're working to, to bring into phase one human trials. And so the Mach 1 is really kind of cool because we figured out how to get it to deliver either DNA or the RNA, okay? And you look at these data here, this is actually a cell culture. We just have a monolayer of viral cells, and then we just shoot it with the gene gun. And you can see the RNA on this side and the DNA on this side. And you immediately notice that the RNA looks a lot better. You got a lot more cells expressing your transgene than the, than the DNA, right? And you would think between these two particular two, if I were to ask you which one's going to perform better, give better immune responses, you would say this one, right? Because you got more antigen being produced. But the reality is when we actually test that, we actually see that the gene gun, when it delivers the RNA is a, a, a bit better, but not that much better. And actually the DNA uh, delivered by gene is almost as better as our, our control or replicating RNA formulated with those lion nanoparticles. So the gist here is why, first of all, why would RNA give you more cells expressing the DNA? Well, RNA just has to get in your cytoplasm, okay? The DNA has to make it into your nucleus, okay? So most of the DNA gets in the cytoplasm and doesn't do anything, okay? But here's another difference is that once it gets in, the DNA uh, transfected cells, they last longer. Whereas with the RNA transfected cells, they go shorter. So you got more cells, lasting shorter period of time or fewer cells, less than longer period of time. And that's why we eventually get fairly comparable immune responses from either DNA or RNA delivery with the Mach 1. And so we're back to the future here. And I told you initially that we were gonna be able to come up with a, a strategy uh, where if there's ever an outbreak again, we're gonna stop that in its tracks before it actually becomes a pandemic. And so we recently got funding for the Department of Defense program called DARPA now, it's called Nucleic Acids on Demand Worldwide, okay? And the way that wants to work is to actually offer near immediate doses of vaccine or therapeutics for infectious diseases. And so the way that works is that, let's say there's a pathogen that has an outbreak somewhere uh, in Africa or something, and they go immediately in with like a codex box. And in that box, everything you need to be able to make 100 or 500,000 vaccine doses, okay? And the only way you're gonna be able to do that is with nucleic acids, okay? Because they, and, and pop, probably DNA, because DNA is a lot more stable than RNA, if you remember, at room temperature. And so the idea is they'll produce that and they'll produce that within days so that they can vaccinate first responders and everybody surrounding that particular outbreak and stop that outbreak before it gets a chance to become a pandemic. So this is kind of the strategy here is kind of twofold. One, where you get the nucleic acid and then you'll be able to design it and you know produce it in three days and inject that into the host, okay? And then and the, your body will make immune responses. Another strategy is a little bit different is that you actually, uh, you know, when you get vaccinated, it takes you a few weeks to build up immunity so you're protected. Well, another idea is that we can actually use DNA or RNA to encode the antibody itself. 
So if you inject that DNA or RNA in your body, you start producing antibody immediately and you have immediate protection. So that's, that's the vision that we have uh, for this uh, uh, DARPA Now project. And we're doing this in collaboration with GE Global Health. And GE Global Health has figured out a way to actually uh, um, manufacture and scale up DNA within three, three days. So shown here is, is a collaborator of mine, John Nelson at GE, who has in three days made 5,000 vaccine doses right here in this little bottle. And the idea is that we're gonna eventually deliver that with a gene gun, thus realizing the prophecy I told you at the beginning of my talk. So how's that gonna work? I wanna get introduced you very quickly to ring vaccination. Okay, ring vaccination is sort of an idea where you would identify cases and then you would vaccinate the close contacts. Okay, right now we're in a pandemic where we have to have a herd immunity. Yeah, almost 70% of the population is gonna to need to build up immunity to shut down the pandemic. We wanna stop any future pandemics. Well, as long as you know people and animals live together, we're always gonna have zoonotic transmission of viruses from animals to people. So we can't stop that, but we could stop the next pandemic. And we do that by these now boxes, right? Where we're able to, uh, get into an area where there's an outbreak, uh, manufacture very quickly a thousand doses of vaccine and immunize a thousand people surrounding the outbreak. And so you contain it in that way. And that's actually been done in the past, actually, where they had a Ebola outbreak. So you were able to contain it before it actually becomes a pandemic. And so we'll have outbreaks, but the hope is that we'll never see a pandemic of, the mag of this magnitude again. And so as my kind of final closing here, I kind of want to actually show you this picture. This is actually, I live in the Pacific Northwest, as you know, and this is a beautiful woods out back of my home uh, where I go walk and I do a lot more walking there during, since COVID. And uh, as you walk along, you see kind of got these two different pathways, this sort of gnarly one and this one that's kind of nice and open. Uh, and of course, I don't know what it is in the Pacific Northwest, but if there's a, a mossy stump you have to put a poem on there. And this one's the road not taken, okay? Two roads diverge in the wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference, okay? I, I used to read that and I used to think about that's making choices to actually do the crazy thing, right? And to do the thing that nobody else would necessarily do, to stick with DNA or RNA vaccines when everybody else is giving up on them. But since COVID, I actually kind of realized to some extent that a lot of times, you know, if I see the easy path, I'm gonna take the easy path. A lot of times, we end up in the gnarly path, not because we chose to go that way, but because we just got thrown there, okay? And so, you know, the, the whole point of that is that we're all on the gnarly path right now, right? What bigger way of getting thrown off our regular path than, than to have a, a virus, a pandemic affect us? And so um, the, the thing to do when you find yourself in the gnarly way is to get up and just, just find the next path. It might, it might lead you someplace good. And so I just want to close and say a huge thanks, um, primarily my family and friends to start with. These guys are just amazing. Jim, my, my lifelong um, partner, both in the lab and out of the lab, and our two sons, Alex and Brendan. Uh, they, they both graduated last year during, during COVID. Uh, Brendan from, from, uh, um, from high school and Alex from college. And uh, yeah, it was kind of sad to see that they didn't get their ceremony like, you know, traditionally. But what was kind of cool is it came home. And so we kind of, you know, had some time with them that we thought that we were going to be empty nesters. Or as uh, Jim says, you know, we thought we were going to be uh, have an empty nest, but instead we had a fuller house. <laughs> so um, I also want to thank my parents here, my dad. My, late, my dad passed away in 2018 and my mom here. Um, they all were there for me for everything. Here they just came down to Chicago to watch me run a marathon. And then this person here, uh, Heidi Bussies. Okay, if it weren't for Heidi Bussies, my good friend since seventh grade, she's like, she was like, uh, when I met her, she's like, uh, you know, just amazing. She just talked about Hope College all the time because her, her grandparents and parents, I mean, I think she was like third or fourth generation. Um, and she talked me into actually applying to Hope. And if it hadn't been for her, I would have never come to Hope College. But we've been friends ever since. And, you know, friendship is everything. Uh, you know, in our lives and staying in contact with uh, people from college and from high school and the like. Another person here is Melinda Brady. Um, Melinda, I met her when I was at Hope College. You, some of you may recognize that she's actually a daughter of Alan Brady, who was a faculty member at Hope College. And of course, I want to thank the Hope College biology department, in most particular, uh, Jim Gentile. If it hadn't been for him opening the door and let me in and let me actually do research in this lab and taking a chance on me, I would not be here where I am today, but more than that, he kind of taught me how to 
think, you know, how to think about solving problems. And, and the way, by example, more than anything, and the way that he did things, I actually do in many respects the same way. And that's helped me uh, to get to where I am in my life. And uh, really some of the amazing faculty uh, in the Hope College uh, biology department, the late uh, Donald Cronkite, it's just amazing. He's more of a philosopher, I think, than a biologist sometimes. And, and, and Dr. Barney and Dr. Um, all of all of you guys are just amazing. And Lori Hurdle, I mean, she just kept us all in place, you know, made sure that we didn't make any uh, mistakes at all. So anyway, I wanted to thank the Hope College Biology Department. I did not realize how good of an education I had really gotten until I actually left and, and got out there and just really realized um, how much that impacted me. So in terms of being able to get where I got really, really far with just a bachelor's degree. If you remember, I went a good 10 years before I went back and got my PhD. Um, so that bachelor's degree from Hope College Biology Department was, was awesome. And I finally, I wanna thank the Hope College Alumni uh, Board for nominating me. What a huge honor. I looked at uh, you know the people in the past who have received this honor. And I am just humbled to be standing on the same stage with such amazing people. Hope College really produces some amazing people and I really uh, thank you for that honor and I hope I didn't take up too much time and that there is some time uh, for some questions. Deb thank you so much and we do have a bunch of questions so uh, we're going to rifle right into those. The first question comes from Sally. She wanted to know when you were a Hope College student did you have any idea that you'd be working on something like this? I had no idea I was going to be working on anything like this. When I was a Hope College student I was I loved working in in Dr. Gentile's lab and uh, playing with plant cells. I figured I was going to go into environmental toxicology. That was my plan. Actually, even before I started doing research in his lab, I came to Hope College as a pre med. I wanted to get an MD. I was going to uh, you know be a physician. Uh, somewhere along the line, I figured out I I, I didn't like sick people much. <laughs> So it probably wasn't going to be a good career track for me, but I sure like working in the lab and playing with cells. And so, uh, you know, it's a journey. You discover things as you go along. Thanks. Jonathan has a question about the uh, J&J &J vaccine. You know, in the media right now, we've heard a lot about the blood clotting. And he's curious whether or not that's likely tied to vaccine technology with that particular exam, uh, uh, particular administration, that type of vaccine. Or is that just a, what I guess we would call a standard adverse reaction? Um, and, and I might just add to that, you know, six cases out of such a huge number, is this an overreaction? What's your thought as a scientist? Yeah, so it's quite interesting because it, it is rare. It's like one in a million. Uh, so it's about six cases out of six million for the J&J. &J. But what struck me when that came out was that uh, if you remember the AstraZeneca was reporting similar sorts of blood clotting, uh, they've vaccinated 25 million people and they've seen 24 cases. So there's some, to me, I saw that immediately the parallels between those particular things. So I think, uh, I think that's probably why the FDA uh, called it and says, hey, we need to pull this for a minute and actually figure out what's what's causing this. So with vaccines, okay, when we do our clinical trials, they're like 20, 30, 40,000 people. And so if there's going to be an adverse event uh, that would stop the vaccine from being rolled out, it would be a one in 10,000 event. Sometimes with vaccines, we won't find out if there might be very, very rare circumstances that might be one in a million, okay? And we won't find that out until they're rolled out. For example, our flu vaccine got rolled out and it was only after it got rolled out that we discovered that people with egg allergies shouldn't take that vaccine. They would get an anaphylaxis because the vaccine's grown in eggs. So my expectation is that they will figure this out. Is it due to the vaccine or not, number one? And number two, if it is, what is causing that? It's kind of interesting that most of these cases are actually in young women. And I actually think that's going to help them figure out what, what, this, what might be causing this. It's a particular demographic and it's a particular type of vaccine, which is a viral vector vaccine. So, um, but it is still extremely rare and they will re-roll it back out. And my expectation is when they do, they will be able to say, okay, this is safe for, the, for everybody except for maybe this particular group. In the similar way that this flu vaccine is safe for everybody except for people with egg allergies, kind of like that. Thank you. And thank you, Jonathan. Wendell has a question about your gene gun, wants to know if there's a particular place on the human body where the skin is most receptive to the gene gun. Oh, what a great 
great question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That is, there is a great spot. It's actually, you know, and I'm just going to show you a real demonstration with the, uh, with the, uh, just right here. This is where, and that's because it's a nice soft skin and stuff. So uh, if you have thicker stratum corneum, which sometimes like, you know, in areas where, you know, our elbow, you wouldn't want to actually vaccinate there. Uh, you probably wouldn't get as efficient delivery of the particles into, into the epidermis. So we try to pick an, uh, a tender spot. Unfortunately, that's the spot that you, because you have temporarily a little spot and then it disappears in about 48 hours uh, that people prefer to have it actually kind of hidden away that way. I want to encourage people if they've got questions, uh, my producers, bosses tell us we've got about 10 or 15 minutes uh, for your questions. And so you're encouraged uh, to type those into the Q&A function of the uh, the Zoom link or other link that, that you've used to join us. Uh, Judy has a question about you and your availability. Do you have a podcast or a blog for non-scientists who would like to follow your progress? Well, I don't have a podcast or blog, but I periodically will be, uh, have, I have a few little videos that have been uh, produced by Vox and you can actually find them uh, where they actually, you know, I describe kind of technologies and things like that. So currently I don't, I will, we are putting up a website, which will include our Twitter feed. We do have a Twitter feed that actually gives us updates periodically on uh, our latest advances and stuff. So uh, I think we're Fuller, at Fuller Lab is our, our Twitter handle. And I promise to have you on the radio show and ask the best questions I can possibly ask. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> is, uh, we have a question that says, is there some possibility of developing edible vaccines in vegetable or fruit plants via chloroplast recombination using the gene gun? Oh, what a great, great uh, idea. Uh, there are groups actually working on developing edible vaccines uh, and the like. So it's, certainly feasible. I think one of the barriers that have been to edible vaccines is that when you eat stuff, uh, you, uh, your immune system that you're exposed to is actually one designed to induce tolerance rather than Im immunity against something. So that's sort of a barrier that I think oral vaccines in general have to overcome, particularly if they're associated with food. But there are a lot of groups working on that. And certainly the gene gun would be a very efficient way to do that. I want to ask a follow-up to that. It's something that you and I have talked about from time to time. Talk a little bit, and we've talked about it in relationship to maybe a potential booster, but talk a little bit about other methods of administration that are in the works and some are kind of far away and some may not be that far away. Yeah, yeah. So there are oral vaccines being developed right now, for example. There's also intranasal ones. And both of these, what they're trying to do is actually trigger what we call mucosal immunity. Okay, and the idea there is if you actually can get uh, really good mucosal responses, for example, in your lung against SARS-CoV-2, uh, and those, that immunity is at the site where the virus first gets in, it's gonna shut it down before it actually gets going. And so the thinking there is that those particular ways of administering the vaccine, either intranasally, like something like a Flonase bottle or by oral pill, um, and that mucosal immunity might actually provide better protection. So there are those, and there's also a, a, a patch that's being developed as well. Is that a transdermal patch? That is a transdermal patch. It's not as efficient as a gene gun. <laughs> I'll that out there. But it actually is, again, to the point of having room temperature stable, self-administered vaccines. If you imagine if this was in this pandemic, if you were told, hey, okay, we've got these room temperature uh, self-administered vaccines, uh, you know, send one person from every family to the pharmacy, pick it up and bring all the doses back to your family. We would be done with this pandemic by now. So I, I think that's the future that we're looking at. Kathy wants to know how long, much longer it will be until the vaccine that you're currently working on might be able to be used. Yeah, it would probably be uh, within about five to six months. So we are targeting that vaccine primarily in developing countries that are not accessing vaccines as efficiently as, as uh, you know, the United States. Uh, and so Africa and uh, um, Brazil and areas of uh, uh, India as well. So it will probably be available in other countries before it's actually available in the United States. If you have a question, you're welcome to add it at the Q&A uh link down at the bottom of your screen, and we will get that asked of Dr. Fuller. Uh, Rob, I see your question, and it's such a good one. We're going to end with it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that is scientific, but not specifically. Um, the vaccines in general were highly politicized, and money, in other words, and I've had my vaccines in January. Most of us go in, and we didn't have to pay for this. The questions I want to ask is, what role did politics play in this? 
actually factually from a scientist standpoint and who's paying for all of this because they didn't collect insurance information or five dollars from most of us when we got our vaccines yeah there were a number of different organizations governments as well as organizations an organization called CEPI uh, DARPA actually uh, the, the Department of Defense uh, the government uh, COVAX, there was a number of different organizations that actually, uh, it was actually private sector as well as government organizations pooled the resources. I think you recognize that this pandemic is a global issue and it was a major global issue economically as well. And so uh, there was a lot of investment and people putting a lot of money up front. You saw how the clinical trials were accelerated. Well, they all took financial risks in terms of accelerating those particular vaccines and getting them out there uh, produced as quick as possible. So there was quite a bit of effort in terms of actually, uh, you know, putting as much money up front forward because there was more money to be lost if we still had this pandemic uh, raging. With regard to the politics, I think the nationalism has been the biggest issue uh, with, uh, with the vaccines. And as you said, I showed, I showed you the map where the distribution of vaccines is very skewed uh, to more developed countries. And that just really cannot be because the problem is, is that if there's a virus replicating somewhere, it's a problem for all of us, okay? Uh, as long as viruses can replicate, they can generate mutations and new variants. And those new variants could come back and actually reinfect even people who are already vaccinated. So it's in our best interest that we not have a nationalistic attitude about vaccination, that we actually share vaccines and get the world vaccinated together. If you're just joining us, we are visiting with Dr. Deborah Fuller. She is this year's Distinguished Alumni Award winner, one of two um, chosen by the Hope College Alumni Board and given by the alumni of Hope College. And we're talking about vaccines and other things. Dr. Fuller, you talked earlier about the fact that when the research uh, happened, there was a great deal of sharing that maybe typically hadn't taken place among the scientific community. Talk about that. Yeah, that's been, a, that's, a, I hope that stays. This is something that really, really changed. Uh, it, traditionally with science, scientists, you know, we kind of work in our lab and our dark little labs and we work and we get all of our experiments, we analyze them, and then we write up a paper and we take, it takes months and months to publish it. And we don't really share a lot of information. We might go to a conference and present some data, et cetera. Uh, but things kind of move in a slower process that way where, you know, and we build on the, on the shoulders of other scientists, uh, you know, to be able to, to uh, develop our work. Well, what happened with COVID is like those lines just blurred and went away. People started actually posting their results prior to peer review uh, online so that I could actually see what somebody else, else was working on and use what they discovered to help move my field forward. And we were all sharing in real time data and information. And the other thing that changed was really, I remember somebody told me after I was uh, interviewed on Bloomberg TV, you know, I never heard scientists being interviewed on TV before, but you've seen more and more scientists actually being, uh, you know, called uh, to speak on radio shows, for example, and, uh, and, and the like. And so that's actually opened up, broken down the barriers too between scientists and the public as well, in terms of being able to share information and, and help people better understand what's happening with this virus and what's happening with these vaccines. Kayla would like to ask about your gene gun. She wants to know if gene guns likely will be used for more common vaccines like the flu, and if so, when will that be? Oh, what a great question because yeah, we are working on one of those right now. And so um, we have two different flu vaccines that we're working on. We actually were working on this even before COVID. Uh, one's just your typical seasonal flu vaccine uh, that we actually think our gene gun would do better. And the reason is this, is that each year we have to get immunized with a flu vaccine, right? And that's because the virus undergoes uh, genetic drift and is different from last year. So you have to update it, okay? But in, say, a potential pandemic or an outbreak, say a genetic shift where our vaccines won't be as effective, um, the current vaccines won't be, uh, won't be viable because they take about nine months to actually produce an update. Whereas a gene gun type of vaccine would only take several weeks to update. So we're going to put one out like that, but we also have another concept for flu, and that's what I call universal flu vaccine. And that's where we're designing the vaccine so that it's going to induce immune responses against parts other viruses are common to all the variants of influenza. So you get immunized with that one, you will have immunity not just against all the circulating strains, but potentially new emerging ones that might uh, become pandemics in the future. 
Thank you. We've got two more questions for Dr. Fuller before we wind up our time this evening. Uh, the first question that I want to ask has to do with um, the future of our health. You're an expert in Zika. A lot of us had heard of SARS. We had COVID-19. Is this a merry-go-round that as a culture or as a world we are on? What's the end point? How afraid should we be? Yeah, I, as I mentioned, as long as there's, there's people and there's animals living in the same world, zoonotic transmission of viruses in particular can happen. In fact, it happens all the time, okay? It's just a lot of those just end up being innocuous and we never really see them. They don't become pandemics like, like COVID-19 did. And so we have to be diligent. I think one of the things that I'm hoping COVID-19 teaches us is that to be prepared because uh, to continue the kind of research that can help us to respond very quickly so that we can shut down the next pandemic before it gets started. And I think one of the things, a lot of times when there's not a, a disease like this going around, people forget about it. And then there's no funding <laughs> for the kind of research that's gonna be needed to make sure that we're pre prepared to respond to the next one. Well, you mentioned Dr. Brady and you mentioned the Peel Science Center. And so as someone that walked into his class and had anxiety every single time, uh, I wanna give a tip of the hat to Rob Hurdle who is going to uh, offer our final question of the day. And it is this, Deb, what advice would you give to current Hope College students students who are studying in the sciences? Yeah, I would say, you know, I, one of the things that I, I learned um, when I went into Hope College, I had this, this plan, you know, I was going to get my bachelor's degree and then I'm going to get go in, and to get my MD and then I'm going to be a physician. I, I always had those things laid out and planned out. And so I would kind of tell students, I tell this to, to undergraduates that actually do research in my lab as well, is like, don't feel like you have to have the plan all completely laid out, okay? Just follow your heart in some respects, okay? And don't be afraid to take a break now and then and actually try to figure things out. And I think sometimes I get students coming in feeling like, oh, you know, this is what's expected of me, okay? Figure out what you want, uh, find your passion, because really this is, science is not easy. You have to be passionate about it, okay? It's a very, very hard, place to be. But when you're passionate about it, it's the best place to be. And so find your passion in whatever you do. Uh, and don't feel like you have to be in a rush about it. I want to thank all of you that joined us tonight. I want to thank Dr. Fuller, obviously, for her time and for the not just the information you provided, Deb, but the way in which you provide it. I hope all of you that have joined us have gained something from tonight. I hope you will nominate others who are deserving for the various awards that Hope College has to offer. Um, and I hope that you will find your passion and find your calling as students and as alumni, uh, that you'll be able to reflect on the role that Hope played in your life. Uh, Dr. Fuller, congratulations. You truly are a distinguished alumni, and we are grateful, so grateful for your time here this evening. Oh, well, thank you everyone for listening to me. And again, I will just want to re reiterate, uh, I am so honored. I just really appreciate this award. This is just means so much to me. And it means so much to me today to be here with all of you. And I just I see some familiar names. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, and I hope you are joining. Please, uh, especially students, don't don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can find me on the website of the Department of Microbiology at the University of Washington. Uh, send me a note if you just have a question or want some advice, and I'm happy to help you out. Again, thank you, Dr. Fuller, and thank you each of us, each of you, for joining us here tonight. And uh, we stand adjourned. Thanks again, everybody. Bye bye.